Welcome to The Dr. Brooks Show, your place to get real talk about your hormones and the how-tos that will help you put that info into action. I'm your host, Dr. Brooke Kalanick, a functional medicine physician and women's hormone expert. I am also a mother, wife, author, weightlifter, recovering perfectionist, and like you, a woman trying to be more resilient in the face of stress and cultivate more joy. Together, we'll explore hormones, health, and happiness, and my hope is that with each episode, we become a little bit better. Remember, this show is intended for educational purposes only. Please speak with your healthcare provider before implementing the information heard here. If you need more support, please visit betterbydrbrooke.com. Hello, and welcome back to The Dr. Brooke Show. I'm Dr. Brooke, and I'm going to chat with you guys today about tracking food, calories, hormones, all of those sorts of things when it comes to fat loss. So there's a lot of different reasons why we might be eating a particular diet or paying attention to a certain macronutrient group or food group or type of food that we might want to be avoiding or increasing. And there's really a lot of reasons, you know, why we eat the way we do. And it might be lowering inflammation. We might be doing something that is helping a specific, you know, health issue like managing your blood sugar, which probably helps all of your, just like lowering inflammation helps all of your health health issues. But you might be eating, you know, to improve insulin resistance and lower your fasting blood sugar. You might also be eating a certain way, um, you know, to deal with a histamine issue or there's something going on in your gut and you're not tolerating certain foods. You might be following a you know, autoimmune friendly diet, you may just be focusing on, I want to be more nutrient dense, you know, getting those really nutritious foods in more like that ancestral health living, getting in the uh, fermented foods, getting in all those, you know, again, nutrient dense foods, low processed foods, you might just be eating in a certain way to improve how you feel your energy, your brain fog, your mental clarity, You might be eating in a certain way to promote hormonal balance. Maybe it's improving your cycle um, or you might be eating in a way to lose weight. So it's really the fat loss conversation around nutrition and calories, etc. This is going to be a very specific um, conversation about if that's your goal. So again, there's lots of ways to be thinking about food and fat loss is not everyone's goal, but I know it's some of your goals and I know that... um, a lot of the women in my practice are frustrated because they feel like they're doing everything right. They feel like they're eating really quote unquote healthy and they're getting frustrated. And I think we've probably done like everything in health and wellness, these trends come along and we do a lot of good in one way and we really shine light on something. And then we miss something completely because we get kind of tunnel vision and dogmatic about it. And I think in the last, you know, 20 years or even 20 plus years, if you go back to like the Atkins diet, we've given food, you know, a lot, we've given the hormonal impact and the information that comes from food a lot more credence. And it's not just about calories as well. We've, you know, with the ancestral health movement and paleo, we've looked at food again in another lens, nutrient dense, not processed, a little bit more like how, you know, we may have eaten before we had so much modern disease, although it is really hard to completely recreate that lifestyle and it's more than just about what they ate. But in any event, we've kind of steered away from like talking about calories at all. And I think that's probably been a bit of a disservice to those of you who are trying to lose weight. So, so much can be tied up in a weight loss conversation. I hope that I'm going to get to all of it and cover it all. Um, I know this is just kind of a hot hot button for people. And again, I just want to clarify, not everyone needs to lose weight. Not everyone needs to count calories. I'm going to be talking today about, you know, some things you can do that actually help you manage calories that don't have anything to do with tracking. And those for most of myself, most of the women I work with are much better ways to approach this, but there, there is a time and place for it, but there's a lot of problems with it. So I'll talk to you guys today about some different ways to like, mentally track your food or just sort of keep tabs on different variables that can be much more useful and practical and I think not as you know damaging to your psyche and maddening as just like straight up using like a calculator right so that no one really wants to live that way so this will be a conversation about that and hopefully even if you know even if you're not trying to lose weight I think there'll be some good tips about just how to think about your meals and how to kind of match up your calorie intake with your hormones because at the end of the day you need both in order to lose fat in order to lose weight you're going to have to achieve a calorie deficit 
and you're going to want your hormones to be balanced as well. Any of us can do something for like, I don't know, a week, a couple weeks, a month. I mean, how many of you guys have done a Whole30, right? Or even the hangry plan for 30 days or any other restrictive thing. You can do it for a while, but typically your hormones start to rebel. Your metabolism is going to compensate, and that's probably deserves its whole own episode. But for most people, they do okay, and either psychologically or hormonally, they have a lot of cravings, they have less energy, their appetite goes up, maybe their sleep gets off, all those ACEs variables, the hormone talk we taught you in Hangry, you know, in the book was appetite, cravings, energy, and sleep, the ACEs, those are going to get off and then you can't stick to it, right? So not only does your metabolism start to compensate when you go into a caloric deficit, there's only going to be so long you can fight your hormones. And that's when you've sort of like, you've stumbled on an unsustainable diet. And then most people gain back anything that they lost during that time. Now, yes, there's hormones like thyroid and inflammation. I'll talk a little bit about that, that can be bigger than the calorie conversation. So again, what I hope to kind of drive home today is that it takes both. It really takes both of those things, especially to have any kind of longer term success more than, I mean, I think all of us have had the experience of I've lost the same five pounds, 20 times, right? Because you just kind of go through, you know, and you fall back into your to old habits or your hormones get out of balance. And sometimes you even gain more after things like that. And that's a real criticism and a fair criticism of any diet. It just typically isn't sustainable. Now, you might hear diet advice sort of couched under, well, it's a lifestyle change. Again, if it whacks your hormones, this you may think going on a paleo diet is a lifestyle change, but let's say you've gone like really low carb or really low fat or something in the way of making this paleo lifestyle change, it still can create a quote unquote diet effect where you lose some weight, but your hormones get really unhappy. So we can do this like a million ways. Um, but I want to talk today about some ways to think about this differently. And, you know, uh, one other thing we're going to talk about as well is I sort of hate when I see a plan marketed to women that says lose weight and still eat all your favorite foods. Because of course, we all want to do that. That's not always a possibility. And I think when they say that, we're not taking into account your favorite food may be one that's causing you a lot of inflammation, maybe one that really messes up your blood sugar and your hormones. And so therefore, you do have that food that's your favorite, but then you eat more the rest of the day because your blood sugar is out of control and your <laughs> cravings are crazy and your appetite went up or your energy goes down. And then you need to eat, you want to eat more to feel awake again, to feel better and bring your energy out of the toilet. So... I think we all want that. Of course, we all want to have like the health and the physique and all the stuff that we want and have it be the least amount of effort. Um, I feel like that's kind of predatory marketing towards women. And I hope that, um, but we see those ads, right? You see it on Facebook and Instagram. Someone's dangling this program in front of your face and you're like, I want that. I want to eat whatever I want and still have all my health goals achieved. It's usually not that simple. And, you know, again, oftentimes we have, it's just, we need to honor a lot of things. And I, so if you've fallen, and hopefully this, this conversation today will help you guys not fall prey to clicking buy on that button. If you're in this place where you're like, I'm really feeling desperate to get a little bit of progress um, on my weight loss. And of course I would want it to be when I can keep all the, all the foods in, right? I just... Uh, breaks my heart a little bit every time I every time I see that because it's of course good marketing and everybody's going to want to click on that but it may not be I'm saying this across the board but it may not be your best way to get from point A to point B with your goals so before I get into that I want to do um, a couple of sponsors and give a shout out to um, the wonderful people that help make this podcast possible the first one is Blue Blocks if you've listened to the show for the last couple of years you know Blue Blocks has been partnered with me and um, with me and Sarah when Sarah was still doing the show and they're just such a wonderful company and I feel like offering some really great solutions to me at this point you guys are on product overload there's so much available to us whether it's a supplement or some like biohacking device um, and sometimes they really work and sometimes they're a little bit gimmicky and I have to say that all of the products at Blue Blocks I use so many of them that they all are just things that have so seamlessly kind of come into my life relatively easy. So I've, I use their digital eye strain glasses. I use the blue light blockers at night. They also have a red light therapy box called the Hive, which I use, and I don't use it as often as I should, mostly because I just run out of time. But when I do use it, what 
So let me real quick back up to the blue light blockers. Many of you guys are using those and you know that Blue Blocks is one of the companies that guarantees they're blocking out 100% of the blue light that at night will disrupt your melatonin and cortisol timing, disrupt your circadian rhythm. Of course, anything that impacts your sleep that way is going to whack your hormones. It's going to increase inflammation. So use harnessing the power of light in the morning and decreasing the blue light exposure at night is a pretty simple, easy way for us to have better hormone balance. So check those blue blockers out. Again, I love the digital eye strain glasses, but I don't talk about the red light therapy box enough. They have a small one. It's called the Hive, which is also great. Some of the red light therapy boxes are so big. Um, But one of the things I've been using it on as I'm now in my mid 40s, and I think genetically I've been pretty blessed with, um, I probably look a little younger than I am, but definitely starting to notice those signs of aging and the red light therapy is great for that because it regenerates mitochondria. So that's one of the things that red light therapy does. Maybe I should do a whole, would you guys like a whole episode on red light therapy? It helps regenerate mitochondria. So whether you're thinking about aging or you're thinking about, hey, I just want this gland to do a better job. Like let's say it's your thyroid gland. Your thyroid's really sensitive to light because think about your adrenals are deep inside your body cavity, so are your ovaries. But here's this little thyroid just sitting right under the surface of the skin. So it's gonna be impacted probably by blue light, we are starting to see that, you know, we do have maybe some direct effects of blue light on the thyroid that may not be part of the circadian rhythm. It's a little bit new research, but it's interesting to say that, to see that that little gland that sits so close to the surface might be getting impacted by blue light and we can also regenerate it with red light. And so anytime you're trying to get a gland, a thyroid gland, your ovaries, your adrenals to do something, We typically think of taking adaptogens and, you know, all of these lifestyle things. But what we're doing at a fundamental level is you want the mitochondria of the cells in that endocrine gland to do a better job. So red light therapy can be really helpful for that. So check out blueblocks.com. It's B-L-U-B-L-O-X.com. Poke around their website. See some of the cool things they have beyond the blue light blockers. Uh, Again, code better every day at checkout gives you 15% off your order. Definitely use that if you're going to invest in something like... um, you know, the hive or a pair that are great uh, blue blockers. So check them out. The link is in the show notes, blueblocks.com. Next sponsor for the show is Four Sigmatic. Now, again, Four Sigmatic has been with the Dr. Brooks show and the Sarah and Dr. Brooks show for a very long time. They, when they first started, they had just a few different coffee and adaptogen mushroom blends. And at this point, they have such a huge array of these great medicinal mushrooms that are wonderful stress adaptogens. They have them in every way. And I know when they first came out, I wasn't drinking coffee. So I'm like, I really want to try this and do this. But I've had coffee, y'all, in like coming on 11 years. I know that's hard to believe. It just was a food that didn't really work for me. But I love their matcha with reishi. I love matcha, you guys. Matcha is such a powerhouse of antioxidants. It's like green tea on steroids. So when they came out there with their matcha with reishi, it's just such a great way to start my day. I definitely have that every day. I also really like the cacao um, that they have at bedtime. So that's another thing when if you're trying to not have that glass of wine every night or you just want a little something cozy. And I know it's hard to believe summer's almost over, but we're rolling into the fall here. I see some leaves changing already in our neighborhood. So I think we're getting to that cozy. We're really going to want that cozy calm down again at night. So check them out. Such a huge array of products. And again, if you're somebody who's like, I already drink some coffee or tea, why not put some wonderful, um, you know, medicinal mushrooms in there and help your stress response. So it's foursigmatic.com. Again, code better every day. We'll get you 15% at checkout. Link for Blue Blocks and Four Sigmatic will be in the show notes um, for this episode. Okay, let's dive into the things we're going to talk about today. So again, this is a conversation about calories, hormones, and fat loss. Again, there might be a lot of reasons why you eat a certain way and you don't have any kind of weight loss goal. So Again, just keep that framework in mind that um, this is a really specific conversation about that, and that's what we're going to give you some tools for today. So like I said when I started the episode, we've kind of gotten away from this idea that calories don't matter. I think what we want to understand is calories from different foods behave differently. Calories absolutely matter if you are trying to lose weight or if you're trying not to gain weight. We need to be at a calorie deficit to lose. That's just a fundamental truth. Anyone who says otherwise 
is inaccurate. Now, there's a lot of ways to get into a caloric deficit that don't involve you counting calories. So I'm going to go over a bunch of different ideas around that, but I just want to acknowledge the fact that we've kind of... And I said this, I mean, I said this in my our, my first book, Ultimate You, like we really just talked about it's hormones, 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 and anyone tells you it's calories is, is wrong. And I don't even know that I meant that they're wrong. It's just we were really steering that conversation to it's only about hormones. And the truth is about both, again, to get a quick caloric deficit and lose a little bit, you could probably all, you know, white knuckle through that temporarily. And we've all done that. But to maintain it and certainly to have it be healthier and also to prioritize fat loss and not just weight loss, which could be weight, it could be water, fat, muscle, really to prioritize fat loss and also to sustain it and to have you feel good doing it and not sacrifice your other hormones, your thyroid and your cortisol, you know, that we want to do this in a way that not only cuts some calories, so you get that deficit and you get the fat loss, but we also are supporting your hormone balance. Now, as I said in Hangry, in the book, you know, don't do anything for the sake of weight loss that sacrifices your hormones. If you are in a situation where you're not losing weight, but it's because your thyroid is low, your cortisol's off, you got some inflammation going on, let's get you on the right lower inflammatory diet. Let's tend to gut infections or things like that that might be gut health in general, that, you know, your lack of sleep that might be causing you to be inflamed and that's going to hinder your metabolism. As well, if you're already in a low thyroid state or low cortisol state and we put you on a low calorie diet or put a bunch of exercise into your program, you're going to drive those hormones further into disarray. So again, it's about both. And you may have to get yourself in better hormonal balance before you eat. I will say you do have to get yourself in better hormonal balance when it comes to cortisol and thyroid before you try to think about weight loss. So I think there are actually two different things. Hangry is not a weight loss program. Hangry is a hormone balance overwhelm recovery program. It's really well-rounded. It helps you prioritize those things. So if you don't have a copy of Hangry, check that out. It's a really good way for you to look at all of your hormones and do things in the order you need to do them to preserve that balance, heal that. And then if weight loss is a goal, we didn't talk about that until phase four because you really want that good foundation. But many of you guys have laid that foundation. You're like, I've got my thyroid sorted out. I've really worked on my cortisol. I'm watching X, Y, and Z about other aspects of my health. And I'm eating, quote unquote, really healthy, and I can't lose weight. So this is where you're now you're in a good spot to let's go talk about calories in some easy ways to think about, you know, what do you need to track them? Do you need to count them? Talk about all that. And then all the while watching those hormones. And one of your easiest tools to watching that is the ACEs. Like if you're doing something for the sake of fat loss that is, or even like overtraining for some other reason, your hormones are going to let you know right away, usually within a couple of days that they hate this plan. And our goal, your job as the owner of your body is to listen and to honor that, right? And I think we've all probably most everyone listening has had that experience where we push and push and push in a way for the sake of weight loss, not everyone's done that, but many of us have, that put our hormones just in complete disarray. I mean, I talked about that in the intro to the opening chapter of Hangry. Sarah and I both shared our stories and I shared mine. I mean, I put myself in a really bad spot from just like chronic dieting for a couple of years. So we don't want to do that. We want to be thinking, how do I do this in a way that honors my hormones and hopefully some of those things are a little bit more in balance by the time you even start because you're going to have to have hormone balance in order to maintain that weight loss and hopefully prioritize it being, you know, losing fat, you know, and again, it is going to be more complicated for some of you guys, especially initially with the low thyroid cortisol inflammation. Some of those things we're going to want to tend to first. The other way that some of us, you know, have done this in the past is we just start exercising a whole lot more. And that's, again, not always sustainable. So it's not always about trying to eat less, but sometimes we try to exercise more. I've got an episode coming up for you guys uh, also about just how to think about exercise when it comes to fat loss, because what we're doing is not working. (laughs) This idea that we can eat this thing and quote unquote work it off. Um, We really overestimate how many calories we burn. And so I'm going to say something now that most of us don't want to hear. And that is that if you have a fat loss goal, your focus should be on the food. And I personally am someone who would way 
rather have more freedom with my diet and work out more. I like working out. Some of you guys aren't like that. Some of you are like, no, I would much rather not have to spend so much time in the gym or I don't really enjoy it. I do it because there's plenty of reasons to strength train and to move your body. Like that's a whole other conversation. But if you want to do fat loss, I think so many of us are like, well, I will just start working out more because I like that better and I want to have more freedom with having more wine or more treats or whatever. That's probably the first mistake most of us make, especially when it comes to just like the overall calories in the day, is assuming that if we work out more, we are going to be okay and kind of counteract that. It just really, we don't burn as much as we think we do in a workout session. Again, I'll talk about that on an upcoming episode. I'm not saying I don't want you to work out. I do. I do want you to strength train. I do want you to walk at a very minimum. Those things have so many other you know, health and longevity benefits and hormone benefits, but also that muscle mass is going to be key to you maintaining any kind of weight loss that you achieve. But if you're feeling a little overwhelmed or you're feeling stuck, let's look to nutrition first when it comes, you know, to to fat loss. And again, that's what we're talking about today. So how do you know? I mean, the only way you know for sure if you're in a caloric deficit is if you're losing weight. So if you're not, and again, that may not be your goal, but if it is and you're stuck, then we know you're not creating a caloric deficit. So we have to think about some ways that we can do that, right? So, you know, again, no shame in wanting to lose weight, but also please don't feel like that's the only goal that you have. I, you know, there's just so much problems with diet culture, but at the same time, I know some of you are feeling like I'm not comfortable where I'm at and I would like things to be a little bit different. So that's the only way we can know. But there's lots of ways to get to it. You know, we can count a lot of different things. We can count carbs. We can count fat. You can start looking at, a you know, upping protein or you can straight up count calories. You know, there's a lot of different ways you can lower the amount of calories you're taking in per day that are not just straight up using my fitness pal or some sort of, of tracker. And I think we need to think about, well, what's the most enjoyable for you? What's the most sustainable for you? And what is, you know, if you've worked through some program or you've looked at Hangry, I mean, the first pillar in Hangry is find and commit to what works for you. So if you've found something like, for example, I know I have insulin resistance and it is better for me and I get better results when I pay more attention to carbs than I do to fat. Like if I can lower carbs, that normalizes my insulin and I don't have as many cravings. Things are, my ACEs are better balanced and I I do better. That may not be the case for you. So if you know something that has worked for you, you also want to think about what is more enjoyable for you and what is probably more sustainable. And then we can look at this, you know, And I'm going to talk about those in a minute. Like, what are the different things you can look at? You know, so again, I can be more mindful of carbs and then then I can think about fat or portions and then I use some fasting. Like, those are things that I know work for me. I do not count calories. I'm not saying you shouldn't. We're going to talk about that now. But, um, you know, I don't use a tracker or anything. But those are the things I know get me the weight loss results and, um keep my aces in check. You may have found something along the way that works better for you. So we want to think about what we're going to pay attention to is hopefully you know some things that have worked for you and keep your aces in balance. And as I've always said, you may have had something that worked before and it doesn't work now. Your hormones are a moving target. We're going to always have to kind of pay attention to how things are changing and what doesn't work. But in any event, you can either look at these, you know, what are you going to like better? What's going to be more sustainable for you? Is there anything you know about your metabolism that you've learned along the way? Let's let's do more of that. So there's the million dollar question, right? If you want to lose weight, do you have to count calories, you know? So not necessarily. We're going to talk about some problems in general with measuring and tracking. So if you're trying to use an app, like those can be off by up to 20%. That's a lot. That's a really, so you may still be using, you may be thinking, well, Dr. Brooke, I'm already counting. I'm using this app to track my calories, to track my macros. I'm still not getting anywhere. Well, that's a big problem, right? That is a really big problem with weighing, measuring, tracking, is some of these apps can be off by 20%. Labels can be off by 20%. So if you think about something that's 150 calories on a label, it could be 130 calories or it could be, you know, 170 calories. That's a lot, you know? That's a really big difference. So that's something else, that's another problem with how we're tracking right now. If you're using any kind of app or technology, um, It's been estimated in research when they look at people who are self-reporting that we 
under report substantially um, and that about two thirds of the time we can misjudge our portion. So we might be thinking we're having one serving or thinking, you know, this is a reasonable portion. Two thirds of the time, that's more than half the time we're probably, you know, misjudging how much we're actually eating. So all of this can be a problem if like we think we're tracking, like we think we're keeping really, you know, good you know, good good track of things. And a lot of apps are helping you calculate your daily energy expenditure, whether they're tracking macros or calories. And again, there's a lot of error. If we're looking at things being off by 20%, that's a problem. And part of the problem is, you know, these formulas depend on tracking that, your total daily energy expenditure. And it's really hard to accurately estimate what your resting metabolic rate is because it's not this like static thing that is just like doing exactly what we think it, you're going to get less sleep that day your workout's going to be different you're going to be under more stress and your total daily energy expenditure is going to be different you might be sick and how many times are people like kind of under the weather but they don't get totally sick you can keep going about your workout to you keep doing the right things but you don't realize that your metabolism shifted a little bit because it was fighting off a little cold virus or something. And I'm not saying when you're like totally sick, that obviously you might notice that that happens, but it's really much more of an adaptive and reactive, your metabolism is, system. So even when we're using a formula that's supposed to be calorating, this is how many, cal calorating? Calculating how many calories or macros you need, it's based on this idea that we are, accurate on your total daily energy expenditure or your resting metabolic rate, and it might not be, right? I think a final reason why there's a problem with this is this just is not really a way that most of us want to live. I mean, you can really use it as a tool to learn something, and I'll talk about that in a moment, but tracking food and feeling like it can get kind of obsessive feeling. It can really trigger a lot of stuff. A lot of us have a lot of dieting baggage and this either feels overwhelming or it can trigger a lot of, you know, not great stuff. So, I mean, we want to probably talk about first, who are the people that this is not good for? Like using some sort of tracker or starting to pay attention to the to this variable. You know, if you're someone who's prone to like binge eating or disordered eating, disordered eating um, sometimes we see... I'm going to start this diet next week or I look at my calories and it's like I'm going to have to change that. It can trigger this like, you know, kind of like an overwhelming urge to like, let's just eat all the stuff before I start, you know, on, on Monday. And I see this on um, when people fast too, like sometimes this triggers like a lot of overeating later in the day because, you know, they've been, felt really restricted all day. Um, there's this also just this idea of called cognitive dietary restraint, you know, just feeling like you're constantly making an effort to restrict, to limit, to watch what you eat. And that can be so just emotionally taxing. It can be, it can trigger a lot of, you know, I think the people who are most at risk for the stuff going badly are people who tend to be overly self-critical. You're already prone to disordered eating, or maybe you've had an eating disorder in the past, or, you know, even me with my, I wouldn't say I've had disordered eating. Maybe I, I have. I, I know what that when I tried so hard to um, lose weight and be in like quote unquote perfect shape before Ultimate U came out, this was now, um, gosh, a long time ago, <laughs> at least like 13 years, I'd have to look. Um, you know, I don't think I've ever gotten over that experience. As soon as I start to be kind of restrictive with my diet now, it all kind of comes screaming back at me. So some of us have had just a lot of diet baggage and digging into something like calories just, and it can trigger me to like kind of do that thing where I'll eat more because I'm like, I'm not going to be told what to do. I think I have that kind of rebellious personality. And so we have to just be really careful if, if this is a goal is it the most important goal for you to lose weight? Is it, does it do something else? Maybe we need to do some therapy and work on some of those things before we go into this. So just know yourself. If this is crazy making for you, it's not right for you, at least not right now, right? And I think finally, another time that this can really be a problem and maybe tracking is not great for you is if you kind of have this moralizing food, if you will. So you start to kind of attach your worth to I'm eating good, I'm eating clean. And if I have something that bumps my calories up or is off plan or whatever, then I'm bad. So if you feel like your self-worth is sort of tied to how good you are, being a little dieting good girl, um, that's probably not a great a great time for you to be doing this either. You're probably not set up, you know, just set up for not triggering those things if you dig into 
micromanaging with macros or calories or anything like that. Let's say maybe another one is, and I see this in myself too, is if you're somebody who's like, well, but look how good I did all week. Now I deserve a treat. Like I did so good all week. And that, you know, anytime we dig into the dieting behaviors, this stuff can get triggered. And that in the end, A, it's miserable, but also B, that can really up your calories if you're doing those things to sort of compensate for how good you were, right? Or if you're kind of rebelling against this idea. So just know yourself and know if this brings up stuff that in in the end, end is it either miserable or actually thwarts your efforts that might have been better had you just been a little more mindful and not so like detailed calculating and and tracking. So let's talk about some ways to kind of just lower calories without saying I'm only going to eat 1200 calories. They can come from wherever. I'm only going to eat 1500 calories. Um, Let's think about some ways and I'm going to track that and be meticulous about it. Some ways you can start to lower your caloric intake right now if fat loss is a goal is to just eat to 80% fullness. Now people are like, well, I don't really know what that feels like, but that's another way to just shave off a couple of bites. Most of you, if hormones are imbalanced, probably only need to like make some changes for a few hundred calories. You're not going to notice that so much in your ACEs. You're not going to feel different and you'll probably get results. So eating to 80% fullness is actually a pretty easy way to do that. Now, what does that feel like? Think about One way to do this is just think about what your normal portion would be, let's say for dinner or breakfast, and just start with a slightly smaller portion on your plate. That's about 80%, right? Just what if you looked at what you normally ate in a serving and you took 80%, consider what you normally ate 100%, mentally cut that to 80%, just take a slightly smaller portion portion. There you go. That's 80%. You know, you can also start to watch yourself. If you find that you're eating faster, you've gone past 80%. We start to kind of hormonally do some stuff and mentally when, especially if we have kind of a lack mentality around food. I see this with my husband who grew up in a family of five and he swears his mother cooked for three people. So he eats really fast. Not so much anymore. We worked on it, but he will eat fast. He will eat, you know, maybe more frequently. And he always, they, you know, that he would find himself eating faster. So watch yourself. If you are noticing about halfway through your meal, you start picking up the pace, you're going to want to just set the fork down for a second and give yourself a minute. You probably are just about to pass your 80% fullness. And they found this in research that that's what happens. And sometimes we'll start to eat a little bit faster. You know, if you are eating, now people are going to be worried a little bit like, well, how do I know if I'm eating enough then? If you're eating less than 80%, if you're 80%, so 100% fullness is like, I don't feel great. I feel physically slightly uncomfortable. You know, lower than 80%, you feel, you know, you've eaten, you're not starving, but you're not totally satisfied. So, you know, if you're in that place where you're like, okay, I'm trying this experiment. I only took 80% of my normal portion. I'm still a little bit hungry. I'm, you know, not starving, but I'm not totally satisfied. Just that, then you know you're probably not not quite there. So what do you choose next to get yourself from, say, maybe you're at 60% there to get 80% fullness? I'm going to say choose protein. Um, It's going to be more hormonally satiating. It's going to be a little bit better balance. It's also the hardest macro to overeat for most people. So that's if you're a little bit lower. Now, what if you're a little bit 80%, over 80%? Um, you don't really feel like going for a walk. You don't feel 100% physically uncomfortable, like I want to undo my belt, but you don't feel like you could go for a walk or a little bit of activity. That's when you're at like the, I don't know, 85, 90%. So think about if you're a little shy of of 80%, you still feel like you could eat a little bit more. You're just not quite satisfied with your meal. Have a little more protein. If, you, if you're going over when you're all the way full, 100% full, you're going to feel sort of physically uncomfortable, either bloated or, you know, like your pants are too tight. You definitely don't want to go exercise. And if you're right at that 80%, you could sort of comfortably go for a walk. So that's a good way to start to get your, you know, just to get to know yourself. Um, Interestingly, there is some research that sighing is a sign of fullness. So watch your change in breathing. If you notice that you take a deep breath, your breathing changes. Again, you have to be mindful to, yeah, I got to slow down a little bit. But I think anything that gets us to tune in more to ourselves is a worthwhile experiment. So even if you're not doing that for the sake of 80% fullness for, you know, fat loss, I think it's, that's always a good thing, right? To know a little bit more about ourselves. So watch your breathing to change. Do you sigh? Do you 
take a deep breath? Do you just, we have these normal periods of sighing and respiration rate changes a lot. It's really interesting research actually, why we do that and what that means about our stress response. But it's something that sort of comes probably from your vagus nerve getting triggered, but it's a sign that you're getting close. So if you notice that breathing change, then that's another sign to say, okay, I think I might be almost there. Now, again, you have to eat slowly in order to do this. If you eat fast, you're gonna hit past 80 before you even know it because you have to give your brain and your GI tract you know, a chance to talk and catch up. It takes a second. Your hormones are pretty fast, but it does take a second, so is your nervous system, for all that signaling to get caught up of like, I'm getting, your brain is getting feedback from your gut saying, okay, we're doing pretty good. It takes a second for you to feel that. And if you have you know, had disordered eating, if you are prone to binge eating, if you're used to eating when you're busy, if you're stressed out, if you've taught yourself not to listen to your body, these signals are not going to come right away, right? Then that, that is so many of us, right? Like I have just learned to power through, to keep going. I just need to get food in and get on to the next thing, or I need to still do all these other things tonight, or I was really stressed when I sat down. You're not tuned into those signals. It's going to take a little bit of practice and a little bit of, of time for you to tune in and start to, you know, honor how long it takes your body to to catch up. So eating to 80% fullness is something we could all learn to do, and that doesn't involve any trackers, right? So other things you can do it is, like I said with me, is you can watch certain macros. So you can lower fat or you can lower carbs. Those are two pretty easy ways to shave off a few calories without too much tedious tracking. So lowering carbs, I mean, especially if you're someone with insulin resistance issues, this doesn't mean you have to go no carb or keto, but you could just lower the portions of those carbs. For me, the carbs tend to be the things that whack my aces out. I can overeat them really easy because they aggravate my insulin. I get more cravings and, you know, my appetite's sort of like I've eaten, but I could keep going. So that's an easy thing for me to cut out. That might be you. The other thing you can do is, you know, watch fat. So you could, if you're someone who's like, I'm in a low cortisol spot, or I just know myself, I feel better when I have more carbohydrates, then you could just watch, you know, where are extra fat calories coming in, like butter, healthy snacks. I mean, how much, how many of us eat nuts for a snack thinking it's a great protein source? You know, nuts are tasty, um, but they're a really easy way to rack up a ton of calories and you might be better off with a protein-based snack. So a few pieces of turkey versus a handful of almonds might be a more satiating snack that has less calories if you're somebody or like the nut butter. Like, I, I mean, who eats a teaspoon of nut butter? That's what I think it's one or two teaspoons. You know, most of us could eat half a jar of nut butter. So like, that's a terrible snack for me because I could easily consume 600 calories and probably not be all that satiated. It's delicious, but not a great like, you know, macro controlling tool for me. Um, so just watch, you know, um, this is where a lot of like the healthy foods come in. Like, well, I'm only eating sweet potatoes or I'm only eating avocados and nuts and nut butters and, you know, healthy fats, that's where we kind of moralize food. I mean, I've definitely done that. <laughs> like, well, it's, you know, when I first started paleo, I was like, I can eat any amount of these things because they're paleo. Or na- or I've fallen in the trap in the past of like, well, I can eat as much, you know, salami and um, olives and all these other like fatty foods because they are not carbs. <laughs> I found myself in that trap too because I demonized carbs. So it's like as long as I stay away from that, I can not pay any attention to what I'm eating. And sometimes those fall into like healthy snacks and healthy foods. So, you know, or keto snacks. Like I find myself, I can go overboard on those because they don't have any sugar in them, right? They feel they're yummy, especially if I'm doing like low carb or keto at the time, you know, or lower, really lower carb and paying more attention to it. I can overeat those things and they're full of fat because that's what they're supposed to be. (laughs) But, um, so just watch those ideas if they're healthy or not healthy in your mind. Um, do you overdo the ones that you've put in the good category, right? So two ways to kind of watch macros are cut off a little bit of fat, pay attention to how much salad dressing, how much butter you're cooking with, um, all those healthy snacks that are healthy fats, salad dressing, cheeses, there's just ways those calories can add up. And that's a pretty easy, just minimize those portions a little bit, still get the satisfaction in some of those things that you like um, and make those meals more delicious. But just kind of watch those things. And I find snacks can be a real one, real big one for a quick switch to protein from, you know, like a a really fatty snack, like nuts or something like that. Or I mean, I could, my histamine issues don't really allow me to eat a lot of avocado, but I could eat two avocados and be so, so happy. But that would be probably overdoing 
definitely overdoing my histamine issues, but that would be a delicious snack that wouldn't, you know, it would feel quote unquote very healthy, but not, might not, might be a really easy place for me to rack up some extra calories of quote unquote healthy fat. So, um, so those are a couple, another couple ways, 80% fullness, um, pick a macro, eat a little less fat, eat a little less carbs, probably know what has worked for you in the past, know what you prefer, know where you're at hormonally right now in terms of cortisol, might not be great to cut all your carbs out if you're low cortisol. If you don't know where you're at, obviously you can contact me, we can get you some testing, you can take the quiz in Hangry or the quiz at betterbydrbrook.com. Yet another way, in my opinion, is to just focus on protein. Like if you just focus on protein and veggies first, and make sure you're hitting that at least a gram per pound of body weight. Um, make sure you're at least hitting that and that you're getting those bigger servings of veggies every day and then thinking about fats and carbs. So not even thinking about watching anything, just focus on what you should be eating more of than the like cutting it out mentality kind of goes away. So the way I think of this is the P's, three P's. So protein, produce. Now produce could also mean fruit. I'm really talking about veggies here. So proteins and produce and then your personal stuff. Your personal stuff kind of goes back to, again, I'm going to eat protein and produce. So protein and veggies and then I'm going to look at a little bit of fat, probably not a lot of carbs, because that works better for me. You might be the opposite. So maybe my salad, it's going to be big salad, lots of greens, at least three handfuls of veggies per meal. I've got at least 30 grams of protein there. That's the bulk of it. Now, do I need a little extra? I'll probably put a little extra healthy fat in there versus someone else might say, okay, I'm going to throw some starchy carbs in there. I'm going to throw a little bit of grain in there if that works for you. I'm going to throw some fruit in there. So someone else might put more carbs in that salad, whereas I'm probably going to put a little more fat. But my focus is going to be on hitting those macros that I know are the most satiating and the most friendly for my hormones and the easiest ways to control calories. Now, in the past, we've said fat is the most satiating macronutrient. That's not true. We know that's not true. Um, Carbs can be satiating for some people to a certain degree. Carbs are not satiating for me. So know yourself a little bit about that. Fat I feel like I can eat a lot of it. <laughs> it's delicious. So that's not something I'm going to add more of. It makes my meal more delicious, but doesn't necessarily make it more hormonally balanced. But not many of us can overeat protein to a large degree. It's just the hormone signals that come from protein are very satiating and they're very balancing to your blood sugar. So it's just such a powerful food for your hormone balance, for your blood sugar balance, and also a really easy way to control calories. I mean, how many of us can eat two full chicken breasts? So there's, what, 300 calories in chicken breast-ish? Plenty of other foods like a donut or something else that might be, um, or an avocado that is, you know, 300 calories. I don't know exactly how many calories are in an avocado, but you know what I'm saying. There's other foods that have the same amount of calories that are way easier to overeat. Like you could eat more than one donut, but you probably cannot eat that many chicken breasts or that many pieces of steak, etc. So think about it that way really try to focus on the things that you need to get more of. So how do you know how much protein? Again, a gram um, per pound of body weight is a, you know, or at least a 0.8, you know, grams um, per body weight. Most of us are, you know, most of you guys that have been following me are probably getting enough protein, but I still see it. I still see women are like, well, I had protein at that meal. But then we look at it and it's like, well, that's only, you know, half of what you actually needed because they ate two eggs. So that's only like 10 grams of protein where they probably need three times that much, right? So we need to add some other protein to that meal. So uh, Google this. Google what 30 grams of chicken looks like. Google what 30 grams of steak looks like. Just get it in your mind once. It's a little bit bigger than the palm of your hand, um, but just do a quick Google and you can see what it looks like. So you don't have to really think about that. In Hangry, we talk about a pound of veggies a, a day, which is about three big handfuls per meal. If you do those two things, you are definitely going to hit that like comfortable 80% fullness and you're not going to have to think too much about these other things. I find that that doing it this way If you think about, did I have three handfuls of veggies? Did I have, you know, at least 30 grams of protein? You can think of a serving of fat about the size of your thumb. So if you think about that, if that was like some fat in the protein, some olive oil, maybe some nuts on that salad, you know, just think about that's about how much a size of serving of fat is. Now, if you're going to do carbs, I really recommend digging into hangry and just, you know, playing with finding your carb tolerance as a start. 
Now, is this perfect? You're kind of eyeballing protein, three handfuls of veggies? No, but we do find this is usually close enough. So it's a good way to kind of do this, you know, calorie management without counting, without just doing straight up math and also really honoring, you know, your hormones. So a couple of other ways to shave off some calories that I feel like are pretty easy is fasting. So if that works for where you're at with your cortisol and you know that works for you then that's a great way to just skip one meal i'm just taking out one meal now you do want to watch that again i said this earlier many people i'll see they're fasting which is great they're getting some good benefits of autophagy and a gut rest and some insulin lowering when they fast but they overeat during their feeding window so they're actually eating as much as they were before which might be fine maybe you don't want to create a caloric deficit and you're just eating what works for you in that window totally fine but if you're using this and part of your goal is to lose fat or lose weight then we need to make sure that the calories still went down so if you're someone who's like, by the time I'm done fasting, I'm so ravenous that I eat more than I would have normally in that next meal, then fasting's not a great tool for you. But that can be kind of a, just an easy way mentally to just be like, I just take out breakfast. Um, that works really well for me where I'm at right now. Again, you just got to know yourself, but that could be another tool that shaves off some calories without you thinking about it. The next one is, and this is the final one that I feel like is somewhat, I don't know if this one's as easy because these foods were meant not to be easy to put down, but watch just hedonistic eating, like those highly palatable foods. We're talking French fries, chips, um, you know, all those things that are salty, fatty, carby, and they're just so, or maybe sugary, and they're just so easy to overeat. They were truly designed to be that way. That's why they're so delicious. But those are going to be the hardest foods for you to control your eating around for most of us. There are those of you out there, I know there are, who are like, I can totally have one bite of cake and be fine. I can have one cookie, feel super satisfied, you know, but for a lot of us, that's not the case. And once we kind of go down that road and open up a bag of chips or a bag of popcorn, you know, you can find yourself just really hard to control that. And, you know, it's a really easy way to rack up some calories. So that's another way is just really be very mindful of those foods, especially this is one that I think most of us know about ourselves. It's like if I go down you know, the really good chocolate route, that's going to be harder for me to shut off than if I just skipped it. Now, I do do that sometimes and I try to be really mindful afterwards. But if you know yourself and you know it's like when I have those foods, I just have so many cravings and I'm just off for the rest of the day or, you know, sometimes we have those foods on a Friday night and you're just off for the rest of the weekend. Alcohol can be this way for people too, you know. So just, again, know yourself be your best friend, know those things about yourself and trust that and just say, this is just something that doesn't really work for me. And if you want to be that woman who can say, yeah, I can t so satisfied with one square of dark chocolate. I, I love it. It makes me feel happy. I don't want to give it up entirely. And maybe it's not one, maybe it's two. Know that about yourself and or know that you want to get to that and work on some of those mindful eating strategies and think about what do I need to do? Do I need to get my hormones more in balance to be able to tolerate that better? Do I need to just be more mindful? Like if you were just more mindful and really sit down and be just really grateful for that delicious piece of chocolate. And I'm using chocolate as an example, not to say chocolate's terrible, but you know what I'm saying. There's just some foods that trigger us. And this is another thing I see all over social media where people are like, like, run from any nutritionist who says you can't have a square of dark chocolate every day. One square of dark chocolate's not going to do anything. Well, it might for you. Again, if that throws you into three days of just having your blood sugar be crazy and your cravings are out of control, then that one's, it's not, again, it's not the bad food. We don't want to attach any good, bad moral value to the food. But sometimes those of, some of us don't handle those things very well. And so we just, don't ever want to be doing stuff that makes life harder for us, right? We want to be, again, being our best friend, fourth pillar from Hangry, be your best friend and kind of do and honor what really, what really works for you. So watching those foods can be another really easy way just to keep things in, in check. Okay, so when should you do it? When should you actually get out an app and start tracking? So I really don't recommend tracking with an apps and weighing your food all the time until it's a last stop. Try the strategies I mentioned before. Make sure your hormones are in a good balance. Get to know what macros might be ones you can cut down a little bit. Maybe, you know, play with some of those portion sizes. Learn to kind of listen to your body when you're full. 
maybe it's your high fasting, maybe avoiding just some of the big, big trigger foods. Do those things first. Um, and then if you feel like my hormones are in pretty good balance, or they are when I'm not dieting, right? You don't have an undiagnosed thyroid. We're not dealing with a messed up gut or any of those things. We really feel like your cortisol in a good place. Inflammation's not too bad. We've got some other things dialed in and you've tried those you can do it. Play with those macros first, you know, keeping your protein and veggies and water, don't forget water, and you'll probably be okay. But if you're not, then, or you've hit a plateau, maybe you were doing really, really good and you just can't break through it. Um, But just knowing that the apps can really be off by, you know, again, like 20%. And then our self-reporting is off. So when we type into the app what we ate, we often underestimate what we actually consumed and that can be as high as 30 to 50 percent when we look at what what research shows us about what people actually ate and what they wrote down that's a big big difference so just this is again like i just don't think these apps are necessarily the best because we're you know we take that number and that value and it's like this is the thing i have to abide by this number of calories when again if that's off by 50 percent that's a lot right and again understanding that these calculators are based on assuming what they know about your metabolic rate, which may be off by quite a bit. So if you feel like you've really dialed things in and you've never tracked your weight, again, maybe your first step there is to, again, Google what a serving of nut butter looks like. Google what a serving of protein at 30 grams looks like. Just so you have it in your mind, you don't have to weigh it at every meal. But if you've never done that and you really feel like, I don't have a clue what 30 grams of turkey looks like, then maybe you weigh it once. I really don't want any of us to have to live in a way where I have to pull out that scale with every meal. But if you really don't feel like you have a clue, check it out, right? Let's see what it looks like. And hopefully you can just remember that and take it with you. Um, So when you should not be doing this, you know, I think that we have to just kind of remember it can be such a trap. Watch yourself if it triggers, you know, any of those, you know, disordered eating issues or self-worth issues or lack of confidence, then this is just really probably not a healthy thing. Um, But watch, you know, again, I think where we, a lot of us fall into the trap is like, well, I, you know, don't eat sugar so I can have as much of this thing as I want or sweet potatoes are healthy or avocados are healthy nuts are healthy I see that a lot where we fall into this trap of I'm not going to pay any attention to how much I'm eating because I'm only eating healthy food so again nutrient dense foods is one way to think about food and you're probably got that nailed that's great but if you feel like you want to move the needle on weight loss then you might want to just watch those foods you've put in the category of like this is healthy and I see this you know how many of us have um had a girlfriend do or we've girlfriend do keto or really low carb and they do great and we gain weight on that because sometimes we're over you can overeat any food right for the most part um so just watch that idea if I feel like it's healthy and then also watch again that idea that it, while it, exercise is really important and we need that muscle mass, this idea that um, we're just going to try to work it off, right? We do want to probably pay a little more attention to the calories coming in than the calories we think we're pushing out because it's often just not quite what we think. And that's a bit complicated. We don't even fully understand all of that yet, but I'll do an episode for you um, with that coming up. So what I was hoping to do today was have a conversation about calories. Do they matter? Yes, they're not the only thing that matters by any means. But if you're working on weight loss, we are going to have to create a day for you and, you know, many days in a row of where you're, if you want to lose, where you're burning more than you're eating, or creating that deficit, or if you want to maintain that we're kind of at a status quo and your metabolism is just so complicated, um, And there's so many problems with how we track calories, whether it's our reporting or just the fact that these programs we're using are not totally accurate. And I would always like to get us away from being reliant on something like that because, again, it can be maddening, but also doing it the other way allows you, I think, more opportunity to get to know yourself better, honor yourself more. And to me, if you can do that and accomplish your goal at the same time, then that's a real win-win. And we're not in so much of a dicey situation with, you know, just how crazy making these numbers should be and that we get just so attached to that number of like, this is the number I have to hit. I can't go below this. I can't. And why am I so frustrated? Because I'm sitting at this number. I'm eating the right amount of calories. I'm not getting the right results and ignoring any feedback we're getting from from our body. So I hope this was helpful. I feel like weight loss is a really tricky thing to talk about because I 
again, how I started this episode, um, it is some of your goals and I want to honor that and I want to help you do it in a healthy way. It also, I don't want anyone to think that everyone has to be on any kind of a weight loss journey or anything like that, that you can't be happy where you're at and that there's not a million ways to look at food, right? There's a lot of ways to look at this is the way that I eat for many, many reasons. Again, nutrient density, hormone balance, they don't have anything to do with fat loss. I think there's there's obviously what's important to you. And just a quick reminder that if you are up to weight loss, this is what you want to do right now. We do it in a way that does two things, does not squash your self-esteem, does not trigger any, you know, I'm not good enough. I'm not, can't be happy until any of that stuff until I lose the weight, that we can be happy and present and honor and love our bodies the way they are and still want something more or still want something different. So that's the first most important thing. And the second most important thing is we don't do anything for the sake of weight loss that destroys your hormones. It's just not worth it. You're going to want to tend to those things first, even if you feel like weight loss is a goal that you still have. We want to honor that because it's just not worth it. You're going to just create more problems. We're going to have more weight gain, more hormonal and health fallout. We always want to honor those hormones first. And the hangry tools are great for that. There's so much in that book that teaches you to listen to those things. Um, So that's there for you if you haven't checked that out yet. So, all right. That was a, I hope you guys liked that episode. I've been putting this one together for a while. I really wanted to cover a lot of things today. There's really so much in this. Um, and it's a, pro, a topic that's really near and dear to my heart because I have done a lot of things wrong in that regard in my own life. <laughs> I don't do that for you guys. Um, but, you know, in my own life, I'm a human too. And I've made a lot of those mistakes full, knowing full well that they were the wrong thing to do. But I wanted that weight loss so bad um, and sacrifice myself, my happiness, my confidence, my relationship at times, um, and my hormones for sure in the process. So I don't want you all to go through that fate. Um, or if you have done it before, I don't want you to do it again. All right. Again, thank you to Blue Blocks and Four Sigmatic. Check them out. Links in the show notes for both of those things. If you're not in the private Facebook group, hop on over there. If you're not on my email list, sign up for that. Links for all of those things to keep up with me um, is in the show notes. So check those out, all those products that um, I'm so lucky to have sponsor the show. Links are in the show notes. And if you have questions for the podcast, please post them in the Facebook group so I can answer them on the air. All right. I'll see you all on the next episode. If you need more support or would like to become a patient, please visit betterbydrbrook.com. If you enjoyed this episode, please share and please leave a review. Your experience helps other women find the show and get the help that they need.